So let's have a look at what you can expect in paper two. Similar to paper one, your paper two is going to be a duration of three hours and 150 marks consisting of the following topics, measurement, maps and plans, as well as probability. Question one is going to be a mixture of all three of those topics. Question two, you will find maps and plans along with some probability. In question three, we will see measurement and probability. And question four and five is where we integrate all of those um, topics again. Please remember that finance can also be incorporated in some of these questions, but that does not mean we want you to go and study the full finance topic as it is. Types of questions that you can expect is calculating the cost of fuel for a trip during a maps question or when we have um, a layout plan and you want to paint a wall or tile a floor or anything like that. And then just some tips when you're writing the question paper. Start with question one. Those are all our level one type of questions and you can expect approximately 30 marks over there. Let the mark allocation guide you in time spent per question. So if you look at your three hours and 150 marks, you get approximately one minute and 12 seconds per question. So you can break it up like that for yourself. And any time that you gain on questions that you answered faster than that time frame is um, time that we can use to go back to questions that we left unanswered. Look out for rounding instructions. The general rule in the front of your exam paper is going to be round to two decimal places unless stated otherwise. And remember, when we are working with money, we always round to two decimal places. Even if the second decimal is a zero, we add the zero. And then make sure your answer is in the right unit. Lastly, if a formula is provided, all you need to do is to substitute the known values into the given formula. So let's start with measurements. The sections that can be tested is conversions, where um, we ask you to convert between units. We can do measuring, calculating area, parameter, surface area, and volume. And then we also have time. And then use uh, this as a checklist to see what sections you have practiced examples of already, which sections you still need help with. Remember, we can only touch on some of these today. Okay, so let's start with conversions and time. And on your booklet that would have been printed out to you, we are now going to be doing Act 1 on page 3. Okay, so let's have a look. The question states, below is a swimming pool with its dimensions and two clocks showing the best times to swim. Clock C... This one over here shows Jose's time that he swims on a Saturday afternoon. And the very first one, 1.1, they ask, convert the height of the pool to meters. So if we have a look at the dimensions of the swimming pool, the only one here that has not been given in meters is the 2,000 millimeters. So automatically, that is our hint as to the one that we need to convert. So we're going to say 2,000 millimeters. And then if we want to take that to centimeters first, we divide by 10. And then to meters, we divide by 100. And that gives us two meters. Mark allocation will be method accuracy for divide 10, divide 100. And accuracy in your answer. You can, of course, over here immediately go to say divide by 1000. Question 1.2. The volume of the pool can be calculated using the following formula. Volume is length times width times height state which value from the pool's dimensions represents the width. 
Now, we are all going to be tempted to calculate the volume of this question or of the swimming pool simply because they are giving the formula. But learners, let's read the question again. It says, state which value from the pool's dimensions represents the width. And since this is only two marks, it's not going to be a volume calculation. So we scratch out the 2000 completely. We know this is the height based off the previous question. So all that we are left with is the 50 and the 25 meters. The width is always going to be the lower value of those two. So our answer is going to be 25 meters for two marks accuracy. All right, let's move on to question 1.3. It says, name the time format used to display the best times of the day to swim by clock B. Now, not give the time, but name the time format. We have analog and we have digital. So in this case, they are asking us to have a look at clock B over there. So that would be a digital time format for two accuracy marks. Let's move on to 1.4. 1.4 says to write down in words the time Jose starts to swim on a Saturday afternoon. Now remember, learners, when we are asked to write down in words, there's absolutely no numbers allowed in your sentence. So even if you are tempted to say um, four o'clock and then use the number four, you are going to lose out on marks. So be sure that if they say in words that even the number is written down as a phrase. So let's have a look. This is the clock that they are referring to. And we see that the long hand is on the nine. So it's definitely a quarter two. And then the short hand is just before the six, meaning that it's going to be quarter to six for your first mark. And that will be in the afternoon for your second mark. Okay, and then question 1.5, I am going to give you three minutes to attempt question 1.5 yourselves. You may start. There we go. Uh, so let's quickly have a look. 1.5 says to convert 12 hours and 25 minutes uh, two minutes. So you'll see here I have bolded and underlined 25 minutes. We need to be sure that we separate the 25 minutes in our calculation because we can't multiply these 25 minutes by 60 as they are already in minutes. Otherwise, what we would essentially be doing is changing it into seconds. So we are first just going to separate the 25 minutes. We are going to take the 12 hours and multiply it by 60. And then we are going to add back the 25 minutes. That will give us an answer of 745 minutes in total. Mark allocation is for your time conversion over here and 745 minutes will be your CA answer. Let's move on to recipes where we do some conversions and temperatures. Okay, so we are now heading to Act 2, page number 4. I'm going to start on the right hand side before I read you the question 2.1. They say the Biscoff is a small rectangular cookie with a satisfying caramelized crunch that is served to passengers on a flight. Table one below shows the ingredients and information to prepare homemade cookies. So we have a preparation time, a cooking time, as well as the temperature at which it needs to be baked. 
we have the list of ingredients and we see it serves 16 to 20 people. And here at the bottom, always, always read all of your information. I always tell my learners at school, the golden rule of MathsLit is to read all the information and use those 10 minutes in the beginning reading time to go through, especially the questions that have a lot of content. So here, please note, we have some, we have two conversion factors over here. One cup is so many grams and one ounce is so many grams. So let's have a look at the question. This one will be for three marks. Determine the time you will finish baking the cookies if you start at 11.35. So from the beginning, we see that the preparation time and the cooking time that we read previously is going to be quite important. We're starting at 11.35. So that means I have to add the 20 minutes and add the 15 minutes, which will give me a finishing time of 10 past 12. Your mark allocation is for adding the 20, adding the 15, and then um, giving me your final answer of 10 past 12. Then 2.2, another three minutes that I want you to try yourself. You will see that I have given you a formula so all I want you to do, I'm just going to go back to the previous screen. I want you to use the degrees Fahrenheit that they give you over here and substitute it into that formula that they give you. Okay, that is our three minutes finished. Let's have a look at your answers. Convert the baking temperature to degrees Celsius. So if we have a look, um, degrees Celsius in our formula, it is the one on the left-hand side of the formula. And that is essentially what they are asking us to calculate. They want to know at how many degrees must we put these cookies into the oven. And this is very important rounded to the nearest 10 degrees. Remember in the beginning, we said that we need to be sure of any rounding instructions that we receive. I see a couple of answers coming in on the chat again. Thank you so much. You are once again, 100% correct. So um, the next thing I want you to take note of is that when I give you a formula, I see degree Fahrenheit, the substitution is going to be with the same unit that they give you in the question. So I cannot put this 325 degree Fahrenheit in the place of this degree Celsius. It's a breakdown. That means that you are not answering the question. Okay, so we're going to replace the degree Fahrenheit with 325. We are going to find on our calculators that it is 162,77. But our rounding instruction here is to round to the nearest 10 degrees, meaning the last value will have to be a zero. And in this case, it's going to be 160. Your first two marks is for sub formula and a CA answer. And your final mark is going to be for following any rounding instructions. Let's move on to question 2.3. All right. Determine how many ounces of butter are needed to take the, uh, sorry, not to take, but to bake the Biscoff cookies. Round your answer to the nearest ounce. So we need to, first of all, go have a look at the butter being used in the recipe. So we see that one cup of butter is being used. Then we also note at the bottom that one cup of butter is 225 grams. But remember, they want the answer in ounces. So we also have to use that one ounce is 28,3495 grams. And then I see my answer accidentally displayed here at the top already. But here goes the answer at the bottom. If one cup is 225 grams, we are going to divide that by the conversion factor given to us for one ounce. And that gives us 
four. And if we round that to the nearest whole number this time, or the nearest ounce, it's going to be eight ounces. So method accuracy for dividing, CA for the answer, and then you get a mark for rounding once again. So just a formula tip over here that I teach to my learners. You always take the amount in the question. So the amount in this case is the 225 grams. And if we divide that by the conversion factor in the same unit. So what that means is I can't divide grams by ounces. I can only divide grams by grams. So therefore, I've chosen the 28,3495 to divide with. And then you multiply it with the unit that you want. In this case, which I did not add in over here, it would be a multiplied by one. Or you can just remember the following. When we go from metric to imperial, we are going to divide. And when we go from imperial to metric, we are going to multiply. So either the formula, I'm just going to go back to that for you. This always works for my learners. There we go. Um, or you can just remember the other one that got displayed on the board. Right. Let's move on to the next one. I'm going to give you another three minutes to do act three on page five, number 3.1. All right, that is our three minutes done. Let's have a look at this question together. So 3.1, they are saying that we need to determine the radius of the dispenser in centimeters. Now, that is very important. Remember, we said in the beginning, along with all the rounding instructions, that we also need to look out for units of measurement that they are asking the question in. So if we have a look here uh, at some of the measurements they've given to us that are also in the question, they are specifically talking about the full dispenser, not the dispenser head. So we have to look at the diameter in order to find the radius. Now we should know by now that the radius is half of the diameter. So all we need to do is divide by two and then of course our conversion as well. Remember I said that the question is asking in centimeters. So we take the 54, we divide by 10 to get 5,4 centimeters as a conversion. And then in order to get your final answer, we divide the full diameter by two to get the radius. And that gives us 2,7 centimeters. You can, of course, do it the other way around. You can say 54 divided as this by 2 is 27 millimeters, but then you still have to take it another step further. 27 millimeters divided by 10, which is our conversion, and that will also give you 2,7. Right. Let's have a look at a question where they provide a formula for us. So that would be question 3.2, and we are still on page 5. Question 3.2 says that we need to calculate the capacity of the dispenser and to the nearest milliliters. So you would notice that I put capacity and milliliters in bold. That is a clue as to how we need to approach this question. They also give us the formula that is pi radius squared times height. And if I just move here to the right hand side, remember that pi in maths lit is always going to be 3,142. Another thing that we need to notice is that one milliliter is equal to a thousand cubic millimeters. So let's have a look. We have 150 millimeters as our height. And then we just substitute into the formula. We calculated the radius of the dispenser in the previous question. 
um, as 27 when we said 54 divided by 2. So substituting pi is replaced by 3,142. Our radius is 27. And our height we determined as 150 millimeters. Please note that I used 27 millimeters instead of 2,7 centimeters. And that will be because I have to have the same unit when substituting into the formula. And then that gives us an answer of 300 sorry, 3,435,777,7 cubic millimeters. But, and this is why I bolded capacity as well. Remember, capacity refers to how much liquid an object can hold, whereas volume refers to the space that an object takes up. Capacity is always measured in liters, milliliters, kiloliters, and volume is centimeters um, cubed, millimeters cubed, etc. So we still need to use this one milliliter is a thousand cubic millimeter conversion. So we divide our answer by 1000, and that will give us 344 rounded, because again, they said to the nearest milliliters. So you get a mark for subbing into the formula, an accuracy mark, and then your rounding mark. You can, of course, use that one milliliter is equal to one cubic centimeter. That is essentially what a thousand cubic millimeters is. It's one cubic centimeter. If you do that, your answer will look slightly different you will replace your measurement values with the centimeter values. So pi is still 3,142. We multiply that by 2,7 squared. Note the 2,7 centimeters that we got in the previous question times by 15 centimeters. 15 centimeters is simply your height divided by 10, which gives us 343,57777, and then we can immediately round to the answers. Your mark allocation stays the exact same for this option. Okay, again, giving the floor to you, Act 3, Question 3.3, .3, determine the number of dispensers that can be filled from a 20 liter liquid soap bottle. You can try that one yourself for me. Right. There we go. That's three minutes. Let's have a look at this question. So the question was that we need to determine the number of dispensers that can be filled from a 20 liter liquid soap bottle. Now, remember in our previous answer, we found that this bottle has a capacity of 344 milliliters. Now, again, we are stuck with a conversion question over here, even though they did not specifically mention a conversion. We need to see that they give us 20 liters over here, and our previous question dealt with milliliters. Therefore, we are going to have to multiply the 20 liters by 1,000, to change it from liters to milliliters. Then we will divide that by 344 milliliters, which gives us 58,14. And we have a rounding instruction. No, no, sorry, I'm lying. We don't have a rounding instruction, but we are going to have to round this question down. The reason for this is the question is asking us the number of dispensers that can be filled. Now, I'm not going to be very happy if I go to the shop and I get a small little bit of soap in a bottle because they wanted to sell all of the soap that they have available. We cannot put 59 as, a, um, as an answer because we don't have enough to fill that bottle. We can't keep our answer as a decimal because we can't only fill a bottle with a little bit of soap and expect to sell that bottle. 
So therefore, in this case, we are going to round the question down. Right, then we get to question 3.4. This one's nine marks, as you can see on page six at the top. So I'm going to give you 10 minutes to attempt this question for me. All right, that has been 10 minutes. Let's quickly have a look. Learners, I do realize that a nine mark question can be daunting but the biggest advice that i can give you is to break down the question bit by bit and then take it from there so in the beginning question 3.4 it says the dispenser head is open at the bottom so that's tip number one over here this would be the dispenser head this dispenser at the bottom has no cover so if we wanted to paint there we won't be able to the paint will fall right into the dispenser head all right, so that is tip number one. Then they say that the diameter of the bottom half of the head is 80% um, the top diameter. So that should already be a hint to us that the diameter of this bottom half over here is not the same as the diameter of the top half over there. And then they want to know to calculate the surface area in square millimeters and then of course they give us the formula that we can use over there we are going to calculate the surface area of two separate cylinders let's take a look what you should notice here is that the diameter of the top is not the same as the bottom so therefore two calculations are necessary what you should also note is that the, in the same way that this bottom half doesn't have a bottom, it's also not going to have a top. So the bottom half of the dispenser head has no base and no cover. So when we look at our formula, then we are going to have to adjust the 2 pi radius. Let's have a look. First of all, the height of each separate cylinder of the dispenser head is going to be 31 millimeters, okay? Because we are working with two halves, they said here half of the head, so that means that the height of each separate cylinder is 31 millimeters. Your first mark is going to be method accuracy for identifying that 31 millimeters. Then, if we go to the bottom diameter, that was the second tip over here. The diameter of the bottom half is 80% the top diameter, which means we need to take the 30 millimeters and we are going to multiply that by 80%, which gives us our second method accuracy mark. All right. Um, Please, can I have an indication from the teachers that you are still with me? This is a very lengthy question, and I want to make sure we are all on the same page before I continue. Okay, I see some thumbs up coming through there. Thank you very much. Let's move on. Now, this is not all of it. As you can see, this is only two marks. So let's quickly have a look at the next one. Right, so now we have the height, 31 millimeters. We have the diameter, 24, and that's of the bottom half. We are now going to calculate the top half surface area of this dispenser. So the top half is going to be pi radius square. The, remember, the diameter of the top was 30 millimeters, so the radius is 15. Plus, if I follow my formula, 2 times 3,142 pi times, again, radius, which is going to be the 15 millimeters again, and the height, remember in the previous slide, we determined the height to be 31 millimeters. We are only calculating the surface area of half of this dispenser head. We will then find an answer of 3629,01 square millimeters. So square millimeters or square units, that is what we measure surface area in. 
I just want to give you a mark allocation breakdown. The CA is going to be for the radius, both of them. This one over here and the 15 over there. Then substituting the correct values into this formula and then finding the answer to your accuracy mark. So there we have the, diam the, sorry, the surface area of the top half. Then we have a look at the surface area of the bottom half. Now remember, we know the height is 31, and we calculated the new diameter for this one, which was 24. So your calculation is going to be 2 times 3,142 multiplied by 12 squared times 31. Now, notice how the surface area for the top half of the formula is different to the second half. I take you back to when I said that if I have a look at this bottom half of the dispenser, you cannot remove the top half, which means we can't paint the bottom. It's got no base, but we also cannot paint the top. So therefore, we are not going to include the area of either of those circles. We are simply going to go to the perimeters of the base. So the 12 is coming from the 24 diameter, which we need to divide by 2, substituting into the formula once again, and then finding an answer. So on the previous slide, we had two marks. And then on this one, we have five. So we're hitting seven marks. There's two more to go. So we're still not finished. Okay, hey, let's have a look at the last two. Oh, I forgot to take those away. No worries. All right, so since we are not finished yet, we now need to add those values together that we calculated to give us the surface area of the entire dispenser head. So that's going to be the two values that we found after substituting into the formula. We're simply going to add them together. And then we find our answer of 5,966,658 square millimeters. They did give us a unit instruction. They said to calculate the surface area in square millimeters. So if you use a different unit, you um, still have to add in a conversion. But since all the units were already given in millimeters, that um, should have been an easy calculation to do. Are there any questions on this specific 3.4? You can continue, Xenia. Nothing in the chat here. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Fortain. I really appreciate you. Right, let's continue. Number 3.5. So again, just quickly going to go back here to our final answer. Uh, okay, I see Xenia. Um they all show all the workings of the previous question 3.4. All right, no problem. I have them all on different slides. Are they talking about the one of the five marks? I've got no idea. Um, maybe just from the beginning, just flag it for like a few seconds each slide for the okay. answers for 3.4. Okay, perfect. Let's do that. All right. So here, it should pop up now. There we go. These were the first two marks of question Right, can I move on to the next set of answers for this question? A thumbs up or something? <laughs> Do so. 
All right, here we go. Here we have the next five marks of question 3.4. I see we have a thumbs up so we can move on. Xenia, I also want to remind the teachers, I think Yana will send the marking guidelines to the teachers mm -hmm. in the next term, in the beginning okay. of next term. So don't worry if you didn't get all the answers done. Okay, that's perfect. And then let's have a look at the last part. The final two marks is adding the two surface areas that we calculated together. Um, I see here from uh, Ricky Pretorius, a uh, very, very good question. Yeah, I agree. I think we need to um, start preparing our learners for these high mark questions. I think when they see it, they, they run very, very far away. So we definitely need to practice these nine mark questions. All right, I think we can move on to the next question then. I can always come back later if anybody has any more questions or they would like to see the solutions again. Number 3.5. So um, here they ask to determine the amount of paint needed if the spread rate is 150 cubic, uh, not cubic, square centimeters per liter. Now, we calculated our surface area in the previous question as square millimeters. Now, again, we have to work in the same unit. So our first step here would be to divide by 10 to the power 2. So our conversion rate, when we usually convert from millimeters to centimeters, is simply dividing by 10. But when we are going to convert between square units, we take the same conversion factor that we would have used, in this case, 10, and we square that value. If we have to convert between cubic units, once again, we're going to keep the same conversion factor, but we will then cube the conversion factor. So from square millimeters to square centimeters, we divide by 10 to the power 2, which is going to give us 59,6658 square centimeters, which is what we then use to divide by 150, our spread rate 150, which will give us 0, 0,3977777 two liters. Usually in a case like this where there was no rounding instruction, if you round it to two decimals or three decimals, um, I believe there will be no penalty for rounding. Otherwise, you follow the rounding instructions given to you in the question. So your first one is for the conversion, dividing by 10 to the power of square. You get a CA mark for your answer. An MCA. So what this means is whatever you got here at your CA answer, you have to divide that by 150 and that will then give you your CA answer for the number of liters. So four marks for this question. Okay. And then we move on to question 3.6. Lots of information to read, and the question counts for four marks, so let's have a look. They say calculate the area of the label. So here we see the area of the label itself as a percentage of the front area of the liquid soap container. Round your answer to three decimal places and they're saying we can ignore the handle that's fine 
and they also give us a formula. So if we, I just separated and made it a simple 2D shape instead of working with a 3D shape. If we have a look at the front area of this container that we see that the length is 35 and the height is 55. So even though our formula says length and width, this width in the measurements they give you here is for the width of the 3D shape. So when we look at only the front, it would look more like this one over here and the height is 55. They also gave us the um, 200 square centimeters as the area of the label. So that was already calculated for us. We need to, first of all, calculate the area of the entire front of this container. So if we follow the length times width, it's going to be 35 times 55, which is 1,925 square centimeters. Remember to always add your units. And then the second part of the question says that we need to calculate the area of the label, which is 200, as a percentage. So we're going to take the small part. The label is a small part on the entire front of this container. So we take the small part, we put it over the entire part, and any time that we are asked for percentage calculations, we have to multiply by 100 which will give us 10,3896. And what is very important here, um, learners, we see a rounding instruction. We need to round off to three decimal places. So if we take 3896, this 6 is going to cause the 89 to turn into 90. And even though the third decimal is a zero, we have to include it because we have a rounding instruction. So your mark allocation is accuracy for the area of the container front, method accuracy for calculating the percentage, CA your answer, and again, a mark for a rounding instruction. I think the biggest thing here that we may have um, misunderstood was we maybe used the width 22 centimeters because they give the formula as length times width. All right, so um, that brings us to the end of act number three. So before we go on to act number four, I'm going to give you a five minute break just to stretch your legs and yeah just maybe take a mental break as well right so you can have a five minute break all right <laughs> i hope that was a, a helpful five minute break just to clear the mind um, can I just quickly, uh, Mrs. Fortein, have an indication if you think everybody is ready and settled so that we can continue? Um, we can continue. They should be back. All right. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, quickly, just the question before we took a break was, why is the 55 being used if the width is 22? So I quickly just took the container. Let me just put my laser pointer back on. There we go. So this container, if I look at it in a 3D shape, very simple, I've put it up here on the right hand corner. This is essentially where the measurements would be placed. The length here is 35 centimeter. The width of the 3D shape is 22 centimeters over here. And the height of the 3D shape is 50. Five. And here I have the label indicated as well. Now, in the question, they say the front area, I want to see if I can highlight that for us um, in green. They say that the front area of the liquid soap container. So if I look at only the front area 
of my 3D box that I have here. The top part would go away and the width of my container will also go away. And then I am left with the measurements of only the front as I would view the container from the front and not from the side as a 3D shape. So if, again, if I look only at the front of the container, I'm, I have the length of 35 and the height of 55. So essentially my length for the front is 55 and my width for the front is 35. Um, does this answer your question? Perseverance, can you just give us an indication if that has answered your question? You can just give a reaction thumbs up. Okay. Yes, thank you, it does. Oh, that's thank fantastic. you, Mazzinia. Move oh, on. Of course. Um, that brings us, I believe that was the last question of Act 3. So that brings us to Act number 4 on page 7. So um, just a heads up here, this is a very lengthy question with some good practice examples. We are going to do 4.1 and 4.2 together. And then right at the end, if time allows, we are actually going to do 4.3, 4.4, and 4.5 as a consolidation class test. Right, let's get going with 4.1. The athletics truck below is made up of a rectangle in the middle. So we see there the 84,39 um, and two semicircles with a radius of 36,5 meter at the ends. Now, already I can tell you, remember two semicircles equals one big circle. All right, uh, the length of the rectangle is 84,39 meters. In 4.1, they ask you to calculate the perimeter in meters of only the rectangular area. So not the entire track, only the rectangular area over here and they say you may use the formula perimeter is twice the length plus the width so let's have a look the first thing that you need to note is if the radius of the semicircle um, here is 36,5 that means that this radius which is still part of the semicircle is also 36,5. So we need to use this information to determine the width of this um, rectangle because they already gave us the length. So therefore, the width of the rectangle is going to be the 36,5 multiplied by 2, which gives us 73. We substitute our information into the formula. So the 2 multiplied by the length they give us in the question plus the 73 that we calculated. And that will give you an answer of 314,78. So your method accuracy mark is for the 73 meters. Substituting the correct values into the formula and then finding the answer. So just quickly again, this 36,5 is coming from the fact that this section here is also the radius of this semicircle. Okay, and then we of course have to double it up um, to find the width along the side of the rectangle. Number 4.2, lovely seven mark question. So I will give you seven minutes. All right, let's have a look. So seven minutes or seven marks. Remember in the beginning I said if we break down our 150 marks for the full three um, hours, we have approximately one minute and 12 seconds. So if we can stay within about one minute per mark, we know that we will always have some time left over at the end um, 
just to go through our papers again, have a look at anything we may have missed. Remember, I also said star any questions that you would like to go back to. That doesn't only count for the tutoring session, uh, it also counts for when you are actually writing the exam. Don't get stuck for too long on a question. Give yourself enough time to finish the paper and then you can always go back to any questions you may have missed. So let's have a look for seven marks, number 4.2. The groundskeeper stated, now usually when they start a question like that, it means that you are going to have to make a conclusion at the end of your answer. So let's keep going. That the cost for cutting the grass, which covers the entire area on the inside. So that would be the oval here on the inside of all the lanes. Um, and the cost is 11,900 Rand. Show by means of calculations whether the cost per square meter is more than 1 Rand 20 per square meter. So what they are saying here is that to cut the grass in the middle, it's going to cost you a certain amount of money for every square meter of that grass. So reading in between the lines here, they are essentially asking us to calculate the area inside and then determining what it would cost to mow the or cut the grass of that area. Let's quickly have a look. First of all, we have a compound figure over here. So we are going to have two area calculations. And you'll see here at the bottom, they even give you a hint. They give you the area of the circle formula and the area of the rectangle. So that should have been your clue as to how many area calculations we are going to do. If I do the area of the rectangle first, it's going to be the length times the width. And that is going to give us our first two marks, 84,39 times 73, and that is 6,160,47 square meters. Once we have that, we move on to the two semicircles. Remember, in the beginning, I said two semicircles make one big circle, so we need to do only one calculation. This is what it looks like. The area of the circle on the outer edges, 3,142 times radius times radius. Now, they gave you the radius already. They said that it was 36,5 meter at the ends. So if we substitute that into our formula, 3,142. Remember, previously in this booklet, we saw that pi is always 3,142. So that's pi times by 36,5 times by 36,5, and that gives us 4,185,9295 square meters. Okay, still not finished. This question was seven marks, and as we can see here, there's only four marks allocated. Moving on, now we are going to determine the cost of cutting the grass and the entire field. So the entire field makes up an area of 10,364,4 square meters. I found this answer by adding the area of the rectangular field and the area of the two semicircles on the outer edges. Then we take the 11,900 Rand in the question because the groundskeeper said, that it is going to cost 11,900 in total, definitely. To find out the cost per square meter, we are going to divide the 11,900 by the number of square meters of this field, which we found in our previous calculation. This will give us 1 Rand 15. So that brings us to our conclusion to say that no, it's not going to be 1 Rand 20. It's not going to be more than 1 Rand 20. It is less than 1 Rand 20. So your last three marks is for adding the two areas together, then dividing the total cost by the total area, which will give you the 1 Rand 15, and then you still need to give me your conclusion at the end. 
very, very important learners. I cannot award you this final opinion mark if you did not give me a comparison. So what this means is, if you did not show me the one rand 15, I cannot give you the one rand 20 mark. Okay, at least a comparison. And then also at least one mark out of all of this needs to be correct in order to award you the opinion mark. I cannot simply give you a mark for writing down your conclusion. I need to see some calculations. I'm going to leave this on the screen for just about a minute so that you can get all the information that you need. And um, after a minute, I'll just check in with you to see if we can move forward. Are there any questions on this slide? Nothing in the chat, ma'am, so you can continue. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Mrs. Fordain. All right, so I'm going to move forward. If you did not get everything, I'm happy to uh, come back to the slide and show you the solutions again. Um, so I mentioned this earlier, if time allows, we are right at the end going to do questions 4.3 all the way through to 4.5 as a consolidation class test at the end. That means the entire page eight. Um, so question 4.2 marks the end of our first section uh, measurements and conversions and we are going to have a look at our next section which is maps and plans so what can we expect in this section over here we um, see first of all here we get to work with scale remember there are two types of scale bar scale or otherwise known as a graphic scale line scale is also acceptable and we have the number scale or we can also refer to that as the ratio scale. Then we also have maps. Here it is very important to know the different types of maps. A question that we like asking at the end of the year is what type of map is shown um, on your question paper. And we get street maps, we get residential or housing, national, provincial, or we get a strip map you also need to obviously know how to read information from these maps we also have models where we look at 2d and 3d so think anything from tiling a floor packing cans of soda into a box packing boxes onto a shelf anything like that all forms part of models and then we also have plans this can be building plans it can be floor plans seating of a classroom or a movie theater, shopping centrums. And I see I made a spelling error. My apologies. That is supposed to say stadium. All right. So let's have a look at our very first one, Act 1. This is actually a set of instructions. And then they're asking us a couple of questions about the instructions. So it says that Step nine of 10 of the assembly illustrations for the Kinsley and Olivia twin bunk beds with a slide is shown below. And then let's just quickly have a look at it. This is the slide part of the bunk beds. And this is what it would look like when it's finished. But we see a little bit of instructions given over here, zoomed into um, a certain part. And then they also give us the list of tools and um, hardware that we need to use to assemble this slide. Okay, 1.1. List three parts that make up the slide. Now, if we have a look at the instructions here on the left-hand corner, it says slide. So if we look, it's part 15, part 16, and part 14. 
and then that would be our answer. Um, please note they did not ask to list the numbers of the parts. So we cannot write 14, 15 and 16. They want to know which part it is. So we write out the words, the slide board, the left slide side and the right slide side. All three of those marks awarded as reading from the table. Question 1.2. Write down the name of the tool that will be used to attach item 23. Now, important to note, a tool is something that you use to attach a part of something. So the slide boards and the side, slide sides, those are not tools, those are objects. Then if we have a look at objects number 22, 23, 25, those are all screws and dowels. Again, that's not a tool. That is something that is be used to attach parts together. But in order to attach those parts, we need to use a tool. And that will then be our Allen key over there. Once again, two RT marks awarded for identifying the tool that needs to be used. And that was act one, nice and easy. Uh, act number two, I'm going to give you 10 minutes. All right, colleagues and learners, let's have a look at act two on page number 10. First couple of questions are all two marks, and then we see a little bit of a meteor question in question 2.6 for six marks. So first of all, they say that uh, below is a detailed map of the Baz bus from Johannesburg to Cape Town. And we see uh, Cape Town here on the left-hand side, and Gauteng is there at the top. They also give us a little key here in the top left saying the straight line route is the Baz bus route. The dotted line route is going to be the shuttle route. We see a circle with a star inside is a compulsory stopover. And then the dotted circles is where we will find backpackers hostels. So the very first question they say 2.1 is to identify the type of map shown above. This will be a route map. So even though it looks like a provincial map, we know that realistically Cape Town and Stellenbosch is not this close together, for example. All right. And the same with Cape Town and Hanmanis. So this is simply just a summary of the route and everything that you can find alongside the route, which is the definition of a route map. Okay, let's have a look. Question 2.2, they say, give the name of the fifth town indicated on the map from Durban to Cape Town. So if I have a look here, I've circled it for you. Here we find Durban. And we are going to follow the straight line route all the way to Cape Town. So they are asking for the fifth town from Durban to Cape Town. So if we count, we are at Durban. There we go, Durban. One, two, three, Kokstad would be number four. Going down on the route, Mtata is our answer. That will be town number five from Durban. We don't include Durban, right? Because they say it's from Durban. So we don't count Durban as number one. Moving on to 2.3. How many compulsory stopovers are on the route from Johannesburg to Cape Town? So again, going back to the key, we saw that the Compulsory stopovers are indicated by a star with a circle around it. So if we start on our route, we'll notice here is the first one at Port Elizabeth. And we have a second one there in Durban, and those are only two. So therefore, our answer is two compulsory stopovers. Um, please note, the question did not say that you have to name the towns where we will stop over. So I would like a value as an answer. 
not a town name. If you had said PE and Durban, then you did not follow the instructions of the question. The question says how many. So again, please make sure to read your questions very, very carefully. And next question, 2.4, which mode of transport would be most suitable when traveling from Peter Maritzburg to Kokstad? So if we have a look at our map again, we see Peter Maritzburg over here, and then we see Kokstad over there. Now, learners, I know that we can travel from Peter Maritzburg to Durban down to Un um 1020 and then to Kokstad. But if you want to take the shortest method here, okay, so we don't want to take a detour, we want to take the shortest method, then we would take the dotted line. And we know that the dotted line indicates the shuttle service or the shuttle mode of transport. And so therefore, shuttle for two RT marks would be our answer. 2.5, give the general direction when traveling from Corkstadt to East London. Now, you'll see I circled the compass over here. When they speak of give the general direction, they are asking you to give a compass direction. We work with the main eight, North, East, South, and West, and then we can work with North, East, um, southeast, southwest, and northwest. Those are the ones that we are going to work with, not the south, southwest, and all of those. Okay. Um, and then, very important, we need to see where we are starting from and where we are going towards. So, in other words, we are starting from Corkstadt and we are moving to East London. So that's moving down in this direction. So if I follow that same route here, you'll see that it is southwest. I would like to draw that for you quickly. So if I have a pen, remember, where did my cursor go? Okay, my cursor has disappeared. That's fine. Um, I'm just going to continue then with the answer that is southwest. I hope my cursor comes back. All right, there's my cursor. Um, right, let's move on. 2.6. This is the nice and meaty question that we have over here. They say that the Baz bus travels a distance, that's important information over there, distance of 1,395 kilometers from Joburg to Cape Town. It has to stop for 30 minutes at all the compulsory stoppages. Now, I remind you that we said in a previous question, there are two stoppages, okay? The bus bus driver claims, okay, so again, Claims, meaning we are most likely going to have to give a conclusion at the end of our answer. That a single trip takes 14 hours and 57 minutes if the bus was traveling at an average speed of 100 kilometers per hour. Verify, showing all calculations if the claim is valid. So right at the end, we are going to conclude our answer either with the word invalid or valid, depending on our calculations. So let's have a look. Time, they give us the formula, time is equal to distance over speed. Okay, so the distance they gave us in the question was 1,395 over 100. That gave us 13,95 hours. Now, very important. This isn't 13 hours and 95 minutes. This 95 indicates uh, 0,95 hours. Okay, so your first two marks are for sub formula and accuracy. Then we see that 
we go from 13,95 to 13 hours and 57 minutes. So where is the 57 minutes coming from? Learners, this is not just picking a value that was in the question already. This is an actual calculation, all right? So we see that the 13 is in hours already. The 0, 0,95, I want to convert to minutes. So I take the 13 hours away, which gives me 0, 0,95. I multiply that by 60 because my conversion factor for turning hours into minutes is 60, which will give me the 57 minutes. Now we can see that we get 13 hours and 57 minutes. But my question says that he claims it was 14 hours and 57 minutes. We mustn't forget to then have a look at the 30 minutes at all compulsory stoppages. So therefore, we add 30 minutes times 2, which will give us 14 hours and 57 minutes. And therefore, the answer is valid. Okay. Let's have a look at mark allocation. I said the first one was sub formula and accuracy. Then you get a conversion mark for converting the 0, 0,95 hours into minutes over here. Then for adding the 30 minutes times 2 for the stoppages, which gave you a CA answer. And then your final mark is for your opinion. This was a bit of a lengthy one. I'm going to leave the solution up for about a minute. If there are any questions, learners, colleagues, please add them in the chat and we can have a look at them together. Okay, I don't see any questions. Maybe just a thumbs up telling me I can continue. That will also do. It's okay, continue, ma'am. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Mrs. Fortain. Okay, next one is Act 3 on page 11. Act 3, page 11. Let's have a look. Uh, same question. They say the map below shows the route from Pretoria to Durban and vice versa. So if we just have a look at the map, we can see from Pretoria down to Durban, these are the distances from Pretoria to each town. Okay, so for example, Pretoria to Bethlehem will be 268. If we work from Durban upwards to Pretoria, we work with the right-hand side distances. For example, Durban will be 166 kilometers from Estcourt, for example. Okay, so let's have a look. Use the map above to answer the questions that follow. 3.1, again, I mentioned how nice it is for us to ask the type of map that we give you. And in this case, this one is going to be a strip map. So it is a straight line summary of all the towns amongst their route. But we all know they did not... Uh, sorry, I see there's some questions. Um, Ma'am, I think continue with 3.1 and then we'll just go back after 3.1, seeing that okay. you already started to 2.6. Yeah. They just want clarity on something. Okay, perfect. No worries. So like I said, a straight line summary of the routes, but we know that a uh, when we drive, we aren't actually going to be simply driving straight lines. Okay. Um, 
I'm quickly just going to put pause on th act number three and go back to 2.6. There is a question over there. They want to know, can you perhaps find the solution using the speed formula to verify? I see your question. If I work backwards from time. Yeah, you've to... got the time formula. Hmm. So they want to know, can you use the speed formula to verify it? I can most certainly do that, but I'm going to ask that we do. I will write the solution when I give the learners the next opportunity to try a question themselves instead of holding everybody back now. Is that fine? All good, ma'am. Okay, perfect. Uh, let me just make a note of that, and then I'll definitely do that in the next break. Um, All right. Okay. Here was the solution of 3.1. We said it was a strip map. Question 3.2. Uh, oh, perfect. Here's another break. Okay. I'm going to do the solutions with you. Um, and then before we go to act number four, I will go back to question 2.6. I've added the solution of working backwards with the time and finding the speed. All right. So let's quickly have a look. Question 3.2. Question 3.2 says, choose the letter A, B, or C that very carefully does not apply to this type of map. So instead of playing the guessing game, we are going to go through each of these a b and c we're going to look at our map and we are going to make a decision as to what applies and what does not apply so the map is not drawn to scale if we look at this map and we think of our country south africa i think it is pretty clear that we cannot uh, take one step and be from Durban to Pretoria or other way around. So this is definitely um, a map that is not drawn to scale, which means this statement is correct. And my question says, I must basically find the statement that's not correct. The second one is the roads are not displayed with straight lines. Now, in the previous question, I actually mentioned to you that a route map is a straight line summary of the entire route. So in this case, the lines are straight. We can see that they are straight. So we need not read question C or solution number C. It is clear that our solution is going to be B. The roads are indeed indicated with straight lines and this statement says that they are not so this statement is incorrect therefore b is our answer right question number 3.3 .3. write down the total distance from peter maritzburg to pretoria okay so peter maritzburg all the way through to pretoria so there we have Peter Marisburg and Pretoria. If I work with the values here on my left hand side, I will see that 488 is in line with Peter Marisburg. So therefore, that is going to be our answer. Another solution that um, you could have decided on is you could have said 557 minus the 69 and you would have gotten the same answer again just 557 minus the 69 and that would have given you the same answer as 488 question 3.4 writes down the national roads to be used to travel from pretoria so there we have pretoria to bethlehem there's that one. So the two roads that we will be traveling on will be the N3 and the N5, both 
accuracy marks. Very important, they did not ask how many national roads, but which national roads. So we actually have to name the two roads, N3 and N5. And then lastly, 3.5, a person drives from Bergville. So here we see Bergville from uh, oh, towards the N3. So they're driving from here to here. Now they have a choice to make. Write down whether that person must turn left or turn right to drive to Peter Maritzburg. So the answer here is going to be right. Let me just show you again. So they are in Bergville over here. Then they are driving along all the way to the N3. And once they get to this point here, to go to Peter Maritzburg, they're going to have to turn right and move down on the N3 until they reach Peter Maritzburg. Okay, that was act number three. Were there any questions on this one? Right, I'm quickly jumping back to um, Act 2, question 2.6. There was a question asking, um, is it possible for learners to work, so the initial solution looked like this, and the question was, can learners work backwards from the time to find the speed and then make their conclusion from here? absolutely perfect but your mark allocations will be the same at the end of the day your first my apologies your first mark would be for the conversion in this case so you would take your conversion mark for the 14,95 hours right turning the 57 minutes into hours and adding it to the 14 then you will receive a method accuracy mark for subtracting the one hour stop in this um, solution, which will give you the 13,95. That will then be your CA mark. So the three marks for the first part of the solution was converting the 14 hours and 57 minutes to hours. The method accuracy for taking away the two stops and then a CA answer for the 13,95, right? Then your sub formula would be to substitute the 13,95 and the distance 1,395 divided by the speed. Then your speed is going to be 1,395 divided by 13,95 which will give you 100 kilometers an hour. This will be your sub formula. The third, uh, I think my cursor is over there. So this would be your sub formula mark. Your accuracy mark in this case is going to be the 100 kilometers per hour. So we see that um, working back from 14 hours, 57 minutes, taking away the stops, the speed would be 100 kilometers per hour. So therefore we can conclude that the statement is valid. Is everyone happy with the alternative solution? Seems so, ma'am. Can continue. Okay. Perfect. Um, just going to exit the slideshow presentation. We are busy with, uh, so we finished Act 3 over here, which means we can move on to Act number 4. Um, colleagues, I do realize that some information did not print on the um map unfortunately so as we go along some of the answers um that are there might confuse the learners as it wasn't given on the map 
I did add, or it was added for me on the map in the slideshow where they have to be looking. So please ask learners to also add it into their own maps as well. In question four, act four, page 12. The map below shows the location of the Cradle of Humankind World Heritage Site. So we see that it is in Gauteng, the province over there. And we also see a scale that was given to us over here. First question 4.1, identify the type of scale used in the map. So when we started this section, I gave you two options. We had a bar scale or a number scale. In this case, it's going to be a bar scale, graphic scale, line scale. Any of those three will be acceptable. And that is an accuracy mark. Then the next question is in which province is the cradle of humankind mainly situated? That would be in Gauteng. So we see over here, Pretoria, Joburg, all of those that forms part of Gauteng. They also give us three other provinces here. There's Mpumalanga, there and there. So I'm sorry, not three, but two. And then we have Limpopo at the top over there as well. But we will see later on when we uh, fix our map that the cradle of humankind is going to be over here where all the arrows are. So that is mainly situated in Gauteng. For two, reading from the table marks. Okay. Question 4.3. And this, um, learners and colleagues, this is where they need to please add information for me. Um, you'll see just to the left of Jobo, kind of over that little dotted area. They must please add the um, name Starkfontein for me, as this is the answer to the following question. But unfortunately, it did not print um, very nicely. Right. I hope everybody has added it now. Otherwise, you are not going to know where you get your answer from in future. 4.3. Write down the caves at the cradle of humankind as shown on the map. So if you've added Starkfontein, Starkfontein is now going to be your answer for two RT marks. And then um, just to ease the minds of the learners. The question paper at the end of the year goes through many, many approval processes. The chances of something like this happening is almost zero. And should there ever be a mistake, the memorandum does get adjusted accordingly. So please don't panic at the end of the year. You will not lose out on any marks. Okay, you will not lose out on any marks. Let's continue to 4.4. Again, <laughs> your answer for the next question is going to be Dalmas, but it was not added onto the map, or it was, it just didn't print. So if learners can please just above Mpumalanga add for me the word Dalmas. All right, your question for this answer is to name the town situated in Mpuma Langa. So, like I said, that is going to be Dalmas for two RT marks. Okay, the last question. Question 4.5. Measure in millimeters. Uh, before, before I read the question, again, a little bit of information that you have to add to your map for me, please. Just um, a little bit below the star and arrow, please add the town um, Maruping for me. So 
just below this arrow and star, please add the town Maruping for me. When we measure now with our rulers, we are going to measure from the star to the middle of that big dot of Johannesburg. Okay. I hope everybody's written that down. The question says measure in millimeters. Now, learners, when you go into your examination, we often see rulers that have only the centimeter markers. The best advice that I can give you is to invest in a clear ruler so that you can see right through the ruler um, that has the millimeter measurements as well as the centimeter measurements because oftentimes we have a 5,3 centimeter or um, a question where they want the answer in millimeters but we can't exactly read from our ruler because our ruler only gives the centimeter measurements. The clear ruler also just helps me to see right through so that I can see if my placement of the ruler is correct. It's sometimes very difficult when you're staring into a pink ruler to see if you've placed the line exactly um, on the spot you want to be measuring from. So ideally there by the red line we would now be placing our rulers and we would measure from the middle of each of those dots and if your exam or if your booklet has been printed in a4 it will be 30 millimeters if it has been printed in a5 uh, you are welcome to post your answer in the chat for us to see as my booklet is always also printed in um, a so if there's anybody that printed in A5, could you please measure for us and then give us your answer in the chat. Otherwise, just note that um, that red line here, I, I actually measured with my ruler and then I wrote down the answer. Okay, I don't see anything coming through. If um, an answer comes through later on, I'm happy to go back to it and read it to everybody, or you will also be able to find it in the chat. Right, two accuracy marks for measuring with your ruler. Then I am going to give you a couple of minutes for Act 5. <laughs> All right, that is our timer finished. Let's quickly have a look at act number five. I see we are well within our time. Um, so we have plenty of time for questions and even to possibly go back to the other questions of act four on the previous topics. Question five says that Maria has a house in Kwakwa. The floor plan of Maria's house showing the actual exterior measurements is given below. That is quite a bit of um, important information. The measurements given on the plan is the real life measurements. The plan measurements is what we will then measure with our ruler. Question 5.1 says, on the floor plan, the exterior length of the um, northern wall is 70 millimeters. So what they are saying is that this wall here, this wall over here, is in fact 70 millimeters if I use a ruler to measure from this end to this end. Okay. That will be my ruler measurement. Then they say we need to determine the scale of the floor plan in the form one to something. So they want to know one unit 
on the plan is equal to how many units in reality. Now, what I always tell my learners, the scale format is always what is on the image to what it is in reality. So image to reality. When I start writing my answer, I take the 70 millimeters on the image. I put it in a ratio to 7,000, the real life measurements. And because we want the ratio in the form of one to something, we have to divide both the left and the right hand side of my ratio by 70. And that gives me one to 70. So for two marks here, it was method accuracy. So putting the measurements in the correct order and then an accuracy mark. If you swap the two values around, if you say 7,000 to 70, unfortunately, it's a breakdown of the question because then you are saying the picture of the um, house is bigger than the actual house itself. So it is very important that you know which order to put your values in. It's always the values of the image to the values of the reality. Right. Question 5.2. Same um, scenario given. This time the question is asking to calculate the exterior side length of the house excluding the step section. So this is the exterior side length of the house given here, 10,714 millimeters. But we see a step section given here, which is 1,200 millimeters. And in the question, they say we need to exclude that section. But we see that the 10,714 goes all the way from this end of the wall through to the start of the steps. So in my calculation, I would have to remove the 1,200 Rand by subtracting it from the 10,714 millimeters. I realize I just said 1,200 Rand, it's millimeters learners. And our answer there is 9,514 millimeters. Mark allocation here, it would be an RT mark for identifying both the 10,714 as well as the 1,200. The reason for this is we have other values shown here as well. So you had to select those two from the bunch. The method accuracy mark is for subtracting and then you get a CA mark for 9,514 millimeters. Right. Question 5.3. This was a very good question. And um, I think in this question, we would be tempted to do things that are very unnecessary. And uh, we need to let the mark allocation in this instance guide us as to how we are going to answer. They say that the area of the kitchen, so here we have the kitchen, is 72% less than the area of the living room. Now, the living room we can see is, is quite a big chunk, right? It's quite a big chunk. Calculate the area in square meters of the kitchen. So we need to calculate the area of the kitchen. If the area of the living room is 39,54 square meters. Now, the reason I said that we might be tempted to do some unnecessary things is you would maybe think you need to now somehow calculate the area of the living room. But that is not possible, um, learners, because we don't have the measurements of the kitchen walls at all. So we don't know what this section length is going to be or the total of this section length we can see is 7,000. But because we don't have any kitchen information, we can only use the information that is in the actual question. So this question 
has got nothing to do with the sketch. So let's have a look. The kitchen is 72% less than the area of the living room. So we would have to take the area of the living room, 39,54. We need to multiply it by 72%, which as a fraction is 72 over 100, which gives us 24,4688. So 72% of the area of the living room is 28,4688 square meters. But that is not our final answer. We now want to know what the total area of the kitchen is going to be. And we can see that it is substantially smaller than the living room. So it can't be 28 and the living room is 39. That's just simply too close together. So we take the area of the living room, 39,54. We subtract the area of the Oh, 72% of that area, which is 28,4688. And then we get a final answer of 11,0712 square meters. Um, I do not see any rounding instructions in this question. So therefore, um, I will also accept 11,07 or 11,1 or 11,071. Anything um, of that will be fine. And then uh, finally, learners and colleagues, this brings us to our last question of the day. Just quickly, mark allocation, method accuracy for the 28,4688, method accuracy for subtracting, and then getting a CA answer. You will not get a CA answer if you didn't subtract something. You can't get two marks for only doing the first step. You have to subtract something from the 39,54, preferably the 28,4688 to get full marks for this question. Right, 5.4. I forgot to hide my mark allocation, that's fine. 5.4 says write down the number of doors to the number of windows as a unit ratio. Now, unit ratio means that we need one to something. Simplified ratio does not necessarily mean we are going to have a one on the left hand side. We can have a two and a three or a four and a seven. Um, anything like that. Unit ratios oftentimes contain decimals, but not always. So don't let that be a deciding factor for your answer. Let's quickly have a look. In this floor plan, windows are indicated by little rectangles alongside the walls. So if we count them, we count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And doors are indicated by using quarter circles. So one, two, three, I see four of the doors. Right. Keeping in mind that we also get something that um, is a sliding door that will be indicated as such with two lines almost overlapping one another, which also count as doors. In this case, we only have swing doors and we have four of them. So you'll see I decided on putting my ratio four to seven. That is because the, um, they gave me that order in the question. They say number of doors, which is four, to the number of windows. So that is why the seven is written on the right hand side of our ratio. You get an RT mark for identifying both the four and the seven. You get a method accuracy basically for following instructions, understanding that a ratio is um, four to seven. So we give it as a ratio form. Please, colleagues and learners, we cannot write a ratio as a fraction. So they cannot say four over seven. They will lose the method accuracy mark. 
and then they will if they don't give their final answer as a ratio here they will lose the ca mark as well so we want it to be written next to one another separated by a colon instead of a fraction and then you get your ca answer for writing it in a unit ratio the one has to be on the left hand side if you swap the two values around, you will lose your method accuracy mark because then you were not following instructions. Um, I see that an alternative method was given in the chat for the previous question, 5.3, I believe. That is perfectly acceptable. Full marks for that one. Okay, well done. I also teach that method to my learners at school. So the method, I'm quickly going to go back. The method that was given in the chat here was that they took the 72%, they subtracted it from 100, and they calculated 18% of the 39,54, so not 18%, sorry, 28% of the 39,54, which immediately gave them this answer over here. So I'm actually quickly going to add that for us so that everyone can see. So if I do this, okay, I just want to get a better background and make this size 14. So the alternative solution here was to say, okay, if 100% minus 72 gives us 28%, then we calculate 28% times 28 over 100. That will immediately give us the 11,0712 square meters. Remember to add your unit. So this is what the alternative solution looked like on um, question 5.3. Mark allocation remains the same. This method accuracy here was for the subtracting. So it will still be for the subtracting on this one over here. The next method accuracy was for calculating the percentage. It will still be for the percentage in the alternative solution. And then, of course, the CA answer will also still be there. Right. Well done for spotting that solution. Just getting back to our ratio question. There we go. This was for three marks, RT, method accuracy, and CA. Colleagues, this does bring us to the end of session two, paper two, except for the couple of questions that we skipped on page eight. Uh, before we go there, are there any questions on any of the exercises that we did today? Or um, even if you have a question on an exercise we didn't touch on, but you would like me to have a look at you are welcome to ask your teachers to add that in the chat for me and we can um, look at some solutions. Question 5.1. Ah. All right, um, I see there is a question from Proteus THS, some clarity on question 5.1. Um, I'm going to assume that the clarity is how I decided on 70 to 7,000. So let's quickly have a look. I mentioned earlier that what I tell my learners 
is, let me add it in here, whenever we have to um, set up a scale, because this is essentially what they are asking us, you see on the layout plan, no scale is given. But in fact, we have the measurements of the picture and we have the measurements in real life. And we need to use those two measurements in order to set up a scale for this floor plan. So the one that I always give my learners to remember, I'm going to make it nice and big, is that we always do the image measurements to the real life measurements. So I always say image to reality. Now, this would be considered a level two type question, but what often happens in a test is we make it level three by not giving the image measurement. So this here that I've now underlined, that is the measurement on the image. If that was not given to me, I would have to take my ruler and actually measure from this end to this end. But they already did that for me. Step one was to measure with the ruler. They've done step one for me already by giving me that information right there. Okay. Um, let me just make it. There we go. So that we all can see the 70 millimeters was given. I did not have to measure. Step two would be to put it in a scale form. So scale form is the measurement of the image which they gave in the question, which was the 70 millimeters. Let's highlight that. And then the real life measurement was given to us on the layout plan. I'm just going to make this a green. Maybe not green, blue. Um, was given to us on the layout plan. And that is the real life measurement. So therefore I have chosen the 7,000 to go on this side, highlighted in the blue. Right. And then in order to go from this step to this step, what is essentially happening is we are saying 70 divided by 70 to 7,000 divided by 70. I'm just going to unhighlight this for us quickly. And then that will give us our unit ratio in the form that they are asking us to do it. One, two, something. Does that clarify the question or should I try a different approach? Yeah, you are correct. I see it. I see it. 7,000 divided by 70 is indeed going to be 100. Thank you so much, uh, Ricky Pretorius. Perfect. All right. Sorry about that. Well spotted.
colleagues, are there any other questions? Page number eight, where um, we wanted to do the rest of Act 4 as a consolidation class test. Uh, instead, I would like to rather get going with the solutions and then you can always practice what is left on your own uh, for the rest of the holiday or otherwise in the new term. So page eight, uh, just to refresh your memory, we were dealing with an athletics track where they gave us a couple of measurements and the first two questions we already completed where we had to calculate the perimeter of the rectangular area and then also um, we had to show that the cost to cut the grass per square meter is um, more or less than one rand 20. So moving on to 4.3, they say the athletics club manager wants to erect a fence five meters away from the track on the outside perimeter of the outer lane. Note, the outer radius ending at the outer lane is 46,26 meters. Okay, uh, the salesperson from Bright's hardware store stated that the required length of fencing needed will be more than 490 meters. Verify using calculations if he is correct. So again, learners, the fact that we need to end our answer with a he is correct or he is incorrect brings um, this to a level four type question. And then they give us the formula for the circumference of a circle. So essentially what they're asking here is we need to calculate the circumference of the outside. Now uh, let's quickly have a look. The 46,26 meters is the radius that they give us um, ending at the outer lane. So that means the lanes are uh, from the beginning here of the field all the way to the end of the lanes is 46,26 meters. I'm going to put my laser pointer on so that we can have a look at that. From here all the way to the outer lanes it is 46,26 meters. But we want to place this fence five meters further than the last lane. So that means we need to add five meters to the 46,26, which gives us a new radius of 51,26. Then just like in one of our previous questions, we have the circumference of the two half circles, which makes one full circle. And then that's going to be two times pi, 3,142 times the radius, which is 51,26, which gives us 322,11784 meters. But that is only the circumference from here to here, and then again from here to here. So that is our curved circumference. Then we still need to add the straight line perimeter of the rectangle, which is 84,39. We have two of those, so we say the circumference of the two circles, 322,11784 plus two times the length of the rectangle, 84,39. Yeah, I made a note we are adding the two straights. That gives us 490,89784. Now, remember going back to our question, we see that he said it will be more than 490. And even though it's just over 490, it's still more than, so therefore he is correct. Let's quickly have a look at mark allocation there. You get an MCA for adding the 51,26. Okay, adding the five meters. 
then you get a substitution into the formula that they provided for you that you can use. A simplify um, mark for giving me the answer of the circumference of both circles. Then you get a CA mark for the final calculation. You will only get the CA mark if you added something of the length of the rectangle. If you didn't add anything, I cannot award a simplifying mark and a CA mark. So something has to be added to the 322. And then your final mark is for the opinion that he is correct. If somehow you had a, a calculation lower than 490, we will see a your answer, which you would then have said is incorrect. Okay. Um, colleagues, learners, and Mrs. Fortain, I see there is literally about one minute left. That is not enough time for us to complete question 4.3. As then 4.5 A and B, as that is nine marks in total. Um, learners, colleagues, you're welcome to finish those with your learners at school next term when they come back before the final exam. But from my side, just thank you so much.